Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Pianist Academy and another live stream, live stream Q&A. Welcome, everybody. Uh, if you're here joining us uh, live, then drop your name in the chat. Let us know where you're from. That's where, how we always like to start these things off. I'm coming to you. It is 10 o'clock in the morning here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, so, yeah, drop your name in the chat. We're going to start off with something super special. Um, Antonio, is Antonio here? I hope he is. Antonio's here. He says hello. Awesome. <laughs> Antonio sent me a Miguel. Hello, Miguel. Uh, Antonio sent me his very, very first ever uh, piece of music that he's learned, and he recorded it for us. What a um, what guts, Antonio. <laughs> So we're going to take a listen to Antonio's um, music first. He was working on Misty, Jazz Standard Misty. And um, we're going to take a listen to his playing and uh, go from there. And then once we finish that segment up, um, the entire rest of the stream will be dedicated to whatever your questions are. Anything, anything at all. And uh, just a reminder, if there are people here that haven't tuned in before, um, I always take submissions of videos to take a look at, and we might do a mini masterclass segment on whatever that submission is, and it's always open to any level from beginner all the way through to advanced, the uh, most advanced repertoire. So whatever anybody's working on, we take a look at. All right. Antonio, you ready? <laughs> all right, here we go. We're going to take a listen to Antonio's Misty. Okay, here we go. All right, Antonio, so I'm going to cut you off before we hear the, the last verse of that. <laughs> but let's give Antonio a big round of applause because that's the first piece he's ever learned. It's from memory. There's a lot of good stuff going on, Antonio. Really, really. So congratulations. And also, a big kudos to you for having the guts to put it out there in public. So really, really, let's, let's drop some applause for Antonio. Awesome. Um, I actually, Antonio, I almost stopped the recording before you got to the bridge, and I'm glad I didn't because there are going to be a few more things to talk about. Um, in the meantime, hello, Haydar, good to see you. And Rajat, is it Rajat? Welcome, Rajat. Beautiful. If you haven't already said hi, we've got a lot of people here that haven't said hi yet. Be sure and drop your name in the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from. That would be great. Okay, so we just heard Antonio play. Very, very, very first piece, Jazz Standard Misty. So Antonio, 
let's boil this down into um, let's boil this down into two basic things. Hey, OCD King is back. Welcome. Um, so Antonio, when we're playing, let's see, you're playing Misty and C, right? And um, you're doing a great job, and you've got really nice a nice foundational posture position in the hand and in the wrist. That's really, really important. We don't want to lose that. But I'd really encourage you, first off, to allow yourself more flexibility, especially in the wrist as you play, so that we're not really locked in. The piece is slow enough right now, what you're working on, that um, if there's tension in the wrist, we're not seeing any negative byproducts from it. But we really want to be sure that if we play something here, right? that I can, while I'm playing, and even while if I'm holding notes down, that I have a nice amount of flexibility here. So one great thing as you, let's see, um, as you play maybe just the opening line. Can you do a little shake as you play? Just making sure both wrists are staying loose. On all of the chords, I know you're, I know you're probably searching for and thinking about where does the hand need to go next and trying to keep it in rhythm and in time. But when we're not thinking about that, take a minute, make sure that the wrists stay loose, both hands. You might have an easier time doing that with the left because they're sitting more on just one chord per change, right? That's the first thing. That's also going to tie into, Antonio. Yes, you just said it in the chat. The octaves. That's the next exact thing that I was going to bring up. Um... I'm not exactly sure there. That's close. <laughs> it's not the right notes. But same thing, Antonio. First off, you're doing a great job making sure you're playing the right notes. <laughs> That's beautiful. But once you play an octave, can we see a little bit more wrist movement? That would be great. And also, and this is a bit of a more advanced thing, but instead of keeping the hand locked into that octave position, which is important, that's important to know where the octaves are, but we don't want to, anytime the hand is locked and is not fluid, in motion, is not being allowed to be free, we are causing tension to build up in the playing, in the playing mechanism. So, if possible, I know this is hard on octaves, but take it one octave at a time. Can we expand into the octave a little bit? And as soon as you've played, maybe if it's hard to do this, let's, let's, let's boil it down to two steps, okay? You have your hand ready to play first. Play, then make sure we release. Go as slow as you need to go so that as we're walking this scale, each note has a very clear release. Right? Then step two, can we begin from a position of release and relaxation? And can we expand into the octave? Even if it's from even if it's from a seventh, a stretch of a seventh into an octave, that would be really, really a great benefit for you. Uh, is that making sense, Antonio? I hope so. Hope so. Jess, hello. <laughs> and uh, Rajat, beautiful. Rajat has a question. We're going to come back to that question in a video to share of rock. Sonata 2, first movement. Beautiful. I'd love to hear it, Rajat. Okay, so Antonio, those are my the technical comments for you for today. Uh, and they're both related to the same kind of thing. Yeah, so Antonio, you said after practicing that passage, your hand is sore. Yeah, we, we always want to avoid that if we can. So we don't have to add any more notes. We don't have to play it any faster. First, build in that relaxation. Then can we play from first a position of relaxation and something like launch ourselves. This is, I think, where the term attack the keys comes from. We're not starting from a position of tension. Uh, one of my, um, this is great for, not only for beginners, but I didn't learn this until I was playing extremely advanced repertoire, but one of my mentors um, taught me about playing the attack of every note as if your playing mechanism that ends in the finger is like a coiled snake. And so a snake, when it's coiled, is not under tension, right? It's, uh, it's not like it's wound up and tense and ready to strike. 
No, it's it's completely relaxed in the most optimal position for it to be to launch itself toward its prey, right? We want to do the same type of thing with the hand, even on just one finger. We can generate a lot of power very, very easily if we play from a place of relaxation. Let the playing mechanism expand into the keys. And then as soon as we're, and we're relaxed, as soon as the note is struck, the quicker we can employ all of that stuff, the more virtuosic repertoire we're able to play. <laughs> Antonio says there are plenty of snakes in, in uh, Baja to learn from. That's great. Great. Um, so everybody, that's we're talking about right now a beginner piece and a beginner arrangement. But that principle, I have taught so many advanced students as well that need to learn that principle. Um, because even though they're able to push through a lot of notes and big chords, um, there's a lot uh, there's a lot to be desired <laughs> in terms of playing from that point of relaxation and being able to have more control over the phrase, more control musically. Um, Kali, hello Kali. Uh, you have a question about chords with both hands. We're going to come back to that in just a second when I finish up with Antonio. Antonio, the second part of the, my my thoughts about your performance are, let's boil this down into two two points again. First off, anytime we're playing very low, register-wise, very low on the keyboard, low notes, and we clump a lot of notes together, we get a really muddy sound. If you don't change anything except move the left hand up an octave, and subsequently the right hand up an octave, we get a much, much cleaner sound. The rest of the arrangement can be exactly the same as what you play. But as long as we're avoiding the very, very low register and playing lots of closely, um, close voicings, let's say, voicings of notes. Uh, no, Antonio, it's not too much pedal. It's, it's that when we get about a fourth or a fifth below middle C, um, and we start to play chords in thirds and fourths, if the voicings of the chords are thirds or fourths apart, the tonality of everything, there's, there's, too much, um, there's too much resonance. There are too many conflicting overtones in the piano. And what we get is just, it's just kind of messy down there. We can play the same arrangement, the same voicing. This is a C major seven in root position. Play it up one octave only. It's much cleaner. The further up we go, cleaner it is. We could boil this down to some physics too. You know, um, frequencies, that's the, the rate at which a sound, the sound wave occurs, right? The lower the frequency is, so the lower the pitch is on the piano, the, um, the longer that frequency, right? An octave, I'm gonna try to boil sum this up as quickly as possible. An octave is double the frequency. So the lowest note on the piano is about 27 hertz. So if we double that, we're a little over 50 hertz. 50, uh, what, three? ish, 54. We can continue to double 110, 220, 440. Many people are familiar with A440. That's where the 440 comes from. Um, notice how as we continue to double and double and double that um, the, of course, as the number that we're doubling gets higher and higher and higher, there's more space. There are more frequencies between them. So think about it this way. When we're really low, there isn't a lot of distance between an octave, right? And then all of these notes have their overtones and they're all just getting mushed together. But the further up we bring that, the more space those overtones have to ring, right? So that's the first part, Antonio. Just move everything up an octave. The second part, Antonio, you're, you're reading my mind. <laughs> Um, so Antonio says, would breaking the low chords help? Yes. And that would actually, that was actually the next suggestion I was going to make. If we practice, and this would just be a great thing to work on for you, even if you want to play the same voicing, make them each just a quarter note. Um, 
it's still, by the time we put the pedal down and the whole chord adds up, that is, um, it still gets a little muddy. If we would change, well, then we lose the root of the chord. So we don't really want to change the pedal either. But if we take it, still take it up an octave, chord here so even though I'm kind of improvising this on the fly there's a lot of stuff I'm playing in the left hand that's broken but it's the same basically the same voicing. It's the same chords you're working on, C7, and then to a G minor seven. And I'm just taking root, fifth, seventh of the chord, and then root, fifth, seventh. We keep going, we have a C dominant seven, root five, seven, and then F, we could do the same thing, root five, seven. That's a great place to start. And you can always just expand from there. You can play root, fifth, the third of the chord, up an octave. That's a beautiful voicing, and I love, love that. And this will be great for getting you to see how harmony works all over the keyboard. So you're still working with the same chords that you're familiar with, right? But we're going to learn new voicings, new ways to arrange the notes. In classical music, we call those inversions. In jazz, they're voicings. Um, it'll just start you, it'll start you down a fantastic path and use your ears to tell you what sounds good. That's a great place to start. So, um, I, that wraps up my thoughts for you, Antonio. I don't want to give you too, too many things to think about those. I think practice those for a bit, experiment with this left hand in Misty and it's going to, gosh, you can have a beautiful, beautiful, uh, version to play that is so close to what you're already doing. And just adding that little bit of um, complexity, it's not even complexity, your left hand will be in the same position it already is. Right? And just that little bit of movement in the left hand will add something really, really nice. Um, so we didn't get to hear. Antonio says you broke down the chords in the f uh, just the end of the piece to add a different sensation. I didn't get to hear that. But um, continue experimenting with that and continue experimenting with, can we get the chords first out of root position? So our C7, C major 7 will turn into, there it is with G on the bottom instead. needs to be there's a lot of places you could go with that right okay Antonio for those of you that heard or you've been stick you've stuck around this time give Antonio another round of applause because this was the very the first piece he's learned so great job Antonio um, feel free if you want to send in another video of your work on this or anything else anytime I'd love to hear the progress you're making and congratulations, that's so, so huge. Um, yeah, and keep playing the music that you like. <laughs> Absolutely. Tiago, welcome. Megan, welcome. Dith, welcome. Whoa. Great. Uh, and Jess, I don't I can't remember if I got to say hello to Jess. Jess, welcome. And Jane is here as well. Welcome. Oh, right. Beautiful. Thanks again for this submission, Antonio. It was a joy, joy to hear, to hear you after all of the work you've put in, and um, and it's gonna be a joy to hear where you continue to go from here. So keep it up. All right, let's jump back. Uh, ha, 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 ha. Let me jump over to um, Rajat's question, and then we're going to come to Kali's question. 
Rajat has a, you have to um, memorize Rachmaninoff's second concerto, uh, third movement, in, uh, I guess that's what, two, a couple weeks? Okay, so the question is, what's the ideal and most efficient progression or the stages of learning a piece of music? And, well, and thanks for the next comment, Rajat. I really appreciate that. Um, beautiful, beautiful. So without pulling my score out of Rock 2, I can give you a couple general tips. <laughs> um, first off, really make sure... Um, the third movement has these repeated segments where we get this. I'm, I do have to pull my score out so I can actually show you this. Let me, I'll be right back. Third movement, I think, is some of the most beautiful music ever written. It's so good. Oh, so... um. We have a lot of these, forgive me, I'm sight reading, because I haven't played this in, oh, a, a two decades almost. <laughs> we have a lot of segments in the third movement that begin like that in the piano. Uh, and then it's followed up with this beautiful, uh, th you know, this theme. Oh, I love that music so much. That's so good. <laughs> um, I would really make sure, one, this happens in many different keys, if I'm not mistaken. Make sure you exactly know and you can start in all of those, be able to start, pick up in all of those places. Um, anywhere, in any piece of music, concerto is a great uh, representation of this, but um, sonatas also, and a lot of concerti are in sonata form. Um, whenever we have themes that repeat, especially if they've been altered, varied in a different key, use slightly different harmonies, be able to pick up and start on every single one of them as if you're beginning from nothing. Um, in an ideal world, we want to go even further than that and be able to start on many phrases within a piece, right? So that's the very, very first thing. Separate out as many of those as you can throughout the movement. Anytime the, the musical, the subject repeats, make sure we, we have those extremely well memorized and we can just pop in. Um, okay. Yeah, we get it later. Um, so that begins in A, cadence is in D flat, and then, yeah, that's what you said, Rajat, D flat, second time. So know those, absolutely. There are plenty of technical challenges throughout the movement, so this brings me to the second point. Any, I like to think about, um, our ability to play a piece of music on kind of a graph. So if you can picture a graph, we have bar one, let's see, this is probably the left side, bar one here, <laughs> the end of the piece here, and then throughout we have measures that work really well, we have measures that we don't play very well, right? This, so this is gonna be something that we've all heard before, but I'm kind of stating it in a slightly different way. You know exactly the measures that don't go as well. Those are the measures we should be spending the majority of the practice time on. If it's only, you know, 16 bars, um, if it's only 16 bars that we work on and we spend an hour of practice time on those because they are the bars that need the most work, absolutely do that. And try to convince yourself it's okay to not run through the rest of the piece. <laughs> At least not yet in your practice session. Hopefully, if you're working on this piece, you've got more than an hour, to an hour a day to practice. Um, so make sure you know all of those spots that are the m biggest struggle. Go to those first in your practice session, practice them a bunch, then start to expand and add them to sections around. 
Um, third, you, you brought up a question about memorization. I think it's really important to be able to <laughs> play a piece backwards, not note for note backwards. Um, but let's say that we are um, toward the end. We have a oh, big, big cadenza type stuff, very Rachmaninoff-esque. Be able to start and start your practice 16 or so bars from the end. Then, in the best case, we'd take the score and we'd actually number from the end. The end would kind of be number one. We'd go back a phrase or two. That would be number two. We'd go back another phrase or two. That would be number three. And then we practice beginning from number one. We begin from number two. We begin from number three and we play to the end. That gets us a lot of reps of the end or the, at least the second half of the piece, which is traditionally uh, bits that are less practiced, less reached during practice, especially if we're used to starting from the top and we're preparing for a performance. We're going to practice starting from the beginning, feeling all the way to the end. But sometimes what happens that we don't realize is that we do a lot of practice on the first half and we might work on that and we might repeat things in the first half of the piece and we're never able to get back to or we run out of practice time to work on the second half. This makes sure that we work on the second half first and gives us all those extra repetitions that the first half already has. Um, so that's a huge thing. At any time I have to play from memory, I am absolutely doing, doing that. Um, uh, let me see. Let me see if there's, um, if there's anything else I can, I can help you out with. Rajat, do you have any um, do you have any moments as you go through the piece that you feel you're very tired? That you, that you feel like the, your hands and your arms are just exhausted. Where are they if you do have them? And then the question that you just that just came in. Oh, come on. Where does the movement begin? So you ask choreography of the main theme. What exactly? Uh, okay, so first four pages and uh, the main theme, are you talking about all of the, uh, let's see. Um, the stuff in there, Rajat, or are we talking about um, the arpeggios that really begin us off? So I think you said that part, the triplets. So it's probably, um, yeah. Forgive me for not playing all the notes. <laughs> um, choreography. When I hear the word choreography, Rajat, I think of kind of an artistic movement. Do you mean that or do you mean just simply navigating what the hands have to do through these bars? Let me let me know what what, what you think. <laughs> navigating. Thanks. Okay. So we're going to go back to one of my favorite things to talk about which is practicing things in groupings. Um, there's a lot of jumping, there's a lot of playing with one and five, right? Uh, yeah. We really wanna have moments that we feel 
and maybe you've already done this and practiced this way, but if you haven't, moments that we feel like we sink in. So right there in the first bar of this theme. We're gonna feel probably an up motion on the first staccato, and then down and in, and up and out. So I end up feeling the triplet group and the quarter note release after as one. It's one gesture, it's one movement. And then we want to continue building on that. So in the next bar, we may probably want to feel a similar thing down on the first note of the triplet. And then how can we bounce so that we can really land down, bounce, bounce, land, bounce, bounce, bounce. Um, that's what I would suggest. And I go as far as writing in up arrows on my score and down arrows. So up when I want to feel that release. And I do actually practice, even though this is very fast, I practice the release with the wrist. And also the down motion has a drop of the wrist. Yeah. Um, so Rajat, does that, have you done that before? Or, or is, <laughs> do you think that's gonna be helpful? Um, if you have done it before, I can try to come up with something else to help you out. But that would be the very first place that I would look, uh, especially navigating the right hand here. The left hand, uh, left hand isn't quite as bad. We have similar things, um, but you can feel that down for the triplet motion, uh, and either a release or a second impetus down. Right? Um, and really what we're trying to do is build in moments of relaxation and build in the, the articulation that we want is going to be pre-programmed in the movement that we're making. That doesn't always line up, but the more we can do that, the easier it's going to be to get through all of this fast stuff. So if we need an accent, it's probably unless there's something else going on around it. It's probably going to be a down motion. If it needs to be a staccato, it's probably going to be an up motion. So the one time in this first bar that that doesn't happen is on the first staccato of the triplet group. In that case, we need to make sure our fingers are loose enough that we can play a good staccato from fingers down while the wrist does something else for us. Yeah? So yeah, Rajat, I would, so you said you've done a little bit. Take it slowly and really program in these, um, these motions. I'm sorry if you, you might be able to hear my dogs. <laughs> they might even come over to say hi. Yep, there's one. <laughs> this is Eleanor. So <laughs> Rajat, that was a great question. Um, I'm going to move on to some other questions right now. Um, but I hope that helps out, and I hope you have, um, I hope you have a super successful performance. Um, are you playing the third movement? Is it with two pianos, or is it with orchestra? Uh, are you playing the whole piece? Have you learned the other two movements? This is probably, Rock 2 is probably my favorite concerto of all. <laughs> so that was, that, thank you for bringing that up. That was a lot of fun to talk through. Oh, all right. Let's jump back and we have a, a handful of other thing, of other questions. And Rajat, you said the whole concerto with orchestra and you've got, um, and you've already got down the other two movements. That's great. So, so awesome. Have a, have a great performance, Rajat. Um, absolutely. I'm a little jealous. <laughs> I've played rock two with two pianos and I have not had a chance to play with orchestra before. So enjoy. <laughs> All right. I know that, uh, let's see, back up kind of close to where we started today. Kali had a question. Kali, I hope you're still here. Um, Kali asks, what would be the best approach to practice chords with both hands at the same time? Oh, let's see. Kali, yeah, drop a note in the chat if you're still here. Because 
because I need a little bit more clarification about exactly what you're asking. If we're going to practice, wh what, what is the point of the practice? Oh, right, Kali's still here. Awesome. So what are you trying to practice, Kali? And are you trying to play the same chords, the same voicings in both hands? Are you trying to play different voicings in both hands? Do these apply to a piece of music? Are you writing something yourself? Um, give me a little bit more guidance, and then I think I can help you a little bit better there. Um, I'm just going to take a minute and wait for, before I, I don't want to jump into anybody else's question because Kali's been waiting for 30 minutes. <laughs> All right, Kali says different voicings, different voicings in both hands. Hmm, okay. One of the things that's um, sticking out in my mind as I think through it is actually, in addition to changing the voicings, let's have the hands do something different as well. So, for example, maybe our... Oh, Rajat, you're fine. <laughs> Maybe our left hand is going to play something blocked. There's an F major 7. Right hand might play an arpeggio starting on a different note, in a different inversion, on a different voicing. We could do something like that. Even if it's not multiple octaves. Um, you might even be able to apply this. Kali, do you know 251 voicings? Uh, in simple terms, we've got. I'm talking about two. Uh, the 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 numbers mean are, are are Roman numeral numbers, really, right? Like minor two, five seven, one major seven. Uh, if we know those voicings, if you don't, take a look at those. If we do know those. We can do the same thing. We can play, gosh, so many permutations of this. Bass note in the left hand. Play an arpeggio in the right. Going ascending for one chord. Descending for the next. And then ascending for the third. And then you could flip that up. We could play descending. You could play descending for all three. You could play descending, ascending, descending. Something that gets the other hand working a little differently. The only rule would be you cannot play whatever inversion or position the opposite hand is playing. So if left hand, like what I just did, if left hand is giving us the root, we cannot play a root voiced D7, D minor seven, right? We don't want to play that in arpeggio. We want to play something else. If you know your upper extensions, um, you, don't, you can just completely avoid the root altogether in the right hand. So there's D minor seven with the nine. I don't play D at all in the right hand. So then here, maybe. So there I've avoided the, the root in the right hand for all of those still arpeggiating them. Then you can flip the hands around. Um, play either a chord or just a note. Uh, let's just pick a note in the right. And we're going to play in, let's see, D minor. So I'm picking the third of the chord. Uh, so that would be an arpeggio on the left. And then we need G7. So there is a little upper extension. Something like that, just to get us continuing to think more and more, but not asking the hands to do um, the same thing at a time. Keeping one hand more simple. I like this idea of playing one note in one hand and doing more stuff with the other hand. Uh, and then, of course, we can add to that. You could play a two-note voicing in left, and then... And then something else on the right. I just went into many more than two notes there. Sorry. <laughs> but you could stick with a two-note voicing in one hand, continue to arpeggiate in the other. Kali, I hope that helps. Um, 
And of course, with 251 voicings, the reason I brought that up is it's super easy to just loop them through all kinds of keys. Um, the way I like to do 251 voicings is take the one we end on, make it our two chord. Right? Uh, so, it's, yeah, the chord we end on, we just make it a minor seven, and that becomes two in the next key, and we continue down by whole step. You continue down like that, uh, so on and so on and so on. I think that's how it went, right? So that was C. No, we don't continue. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we cadence a whole step down. <laughs> All right. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So, Kali, I hope that, I hope that helps. Yes. Um, Rajat, uh, you just asked, so I just want to um, mention this right now. You asked if there's going to be time to go over a, son a second Sonata video during the stream. Um, be sure, uh, it, needs, I, it takes a little bit of uh, time for me to download those and get them on my iPad and stuff. So there is a link below. I don't even know if you sent me an email because all of my devices are in airplane mode so I don't get interrupted by stuff while we're on the stream. Um, but I will absolutely, whenever you send it, I will absolutely put it on the next stream. Just be sure. I always, I just ask that people get it to me at least a couple days ahead of time because then I can make sure I've got the video uploaded, that everything works, <laughs> and then I can play it for you. Um, so Rajat, I'll just say that real quick. I would love to hear. Um, and the next stream will be in two weeks. And, um, yeah, so there's a link in the description or uh, directions in the description to send me an email um, with the video attached to um, Dropbox or Google or something like that. And then I'll be able to play it for everybody here on the stream. Awesome. Yes, Rajal, thanks for the question. Uh, I'm going back up, 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 up to the top. It's great to have um, new people here. So welcome if this is your first time on the stream. Um, big, big welcome. I, <laughs> Dith had a comment earlier that they had their first recital Sunday and the first movement was a total disaster but the second one went pretty well. You know what, Dith? I'm going to give you a big congratulations for that because it's really easy when we're playing live to let whatever happens at the beginning dictate how the rest of everything's going to go. So great job. Even though, even though your first movement wasn't great, what were you playing, by the way? And even though your first movement wasn't awesome, good job keeping it together <laughs> and pushing on through and making sure that the second one, second movement was nice. All right. Bockwards Fellow is here. Hello, Bockwards Fellow. It's good to see you. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see, Miguel had some questions I've seen pop in here. Miguel asked, I think this was to everybody. Miguel asked, what pieces have you been studying recently? So everybody, feel free to chime in. Um, so yeah, what pe what's, what's everybody working on? We know a little bit from Rajat. We know a little bit from Kali. Uh, Miguel said uh, he is working on Brahms 118, 1 and 2. Yeah. So what's everybody working on? And then I'll jump into um, Miguel's question about uh, the Brahms. I am, um, I'll give you while everybody's talk, uh, thinking about that. I have, I'm in the middle of actually composing new stuff. That's a lot of what I do these days. Um, I have a commission that I've been working on this week to arrange um, the Beatles Blackbird for a classical ensemble. Uh, piano, voice, and violin, so a chamber group. And um, so I've been spending a lot of time this week working on that, <laughs> writing that, and um, it's been fun. It's been fun. So that's kind of taken me away from practice and whatnot. Rajat says he's working on the Rock Concerto and Sonata, Prokofiev Sonata 6, Beethoven 109, Granados. Very nice. That's some big music, Rajat. Prokofiev Sonata 6, that is the, the Prokofiev Sonata that I learned um, many years ago. I didn't learn any of the other ones, 
But that is um, one that I've played, performed many times. I've not learned 109 Beethoven. Yeah, beautiful piece. But that is one of the Beethovens I have not worked on. <laughs> uh, let's see, Dith wrote in uh, Clementi Sonatina 4 in F. Awesome. I th I'm pretty sure I know which one that is. Um, let me pull it up for just a second, just to make sure. Oh, okay. Yep, yep. That was a different one than what I was thinking of. I was thinking of number five. But good for you. Good for you. And... What about the third movement, Dith? <laughs> Are you going to learn the third movement? Have you learned the third movement? If we, if one of my students starts the sonatina, we don't. I don't let them um, only learn one movement. <laughs> we learn the whole piece. Awesome. Dith said the third is scary. Oh, I see your previous question now. <laughs> so Dith had asked, do you recommend sticking with a piece you've been working on for a while if you're most of the way finished with it, but you're starting to get frustrated with not completing it? Um, short answer is yes. Um, yeah, stick with it. If you need to, tick a couple days off here and there and to help let your mind reset. Um, gosh, there are pieces that I've played for 15 years. There were pieces when I was, when I was preparing for auditions when I was younger, there are pieces that I played and performed for like three years, practiced them every day for years. Um, and I added little bits of other repertoire in around them, but I'd practice the same stuff for a long time. So um, stick with it, yes. Because as pieces get longer and longer and longer, the amount of time we're going to need to spend and keep ourselves from getting frustrated with it is going to continue to increase. So it's great that we're working on Clementi. It's great that it's not a one-pager and that it's a couple pages long and we're expanding into that kind of rep. Um, but absolutely... Stick with it, yeah? And now, if it's really, really crazy, crazy frustrating and you just, it's keeping you from focusing when you sit down to practice, take a few days off and come back. There's no reason to pound it, just pound it to death if we can't really focus in on exactly what needs improvement. And if the, the emotion around it is getting in the way of that, just, to, just step back and take a little time. Sometimes it's kind of... Um, ironic, but sometimes when we step back, we can actually learn more during the downtime. Um, one of my teachers used to tell me, um, don't practice. If you don't practice for one day, you can tell. If you don't practice for two days, your teacher can tell. If you don't practice for three days, your audience can tell. <laughs> and that's very true. In a lot of ways, it's very true. But um, there is something magical that happens subconsciously if we do take a step back and just throw that piece out for a couple days, may maybe even maybe even a week. I wouldn't let it go longer than that, though, um, because longer than that without the repetition and we start to lose what we've learned and we don't want to let that happen. Yeah. Let me see here. I actually, I don't have a handy copy of Brahms 118. It's not on my iPad, and I don't actually even think I own a hard score, which is crazy because it's so famous. <laughs> um, knowing the pieces and knowing the interbetsy well, this, is, this was a question from uh, Miguel. Uh, 
general advice about Opus 118. Really um, understand where your main melody is going at all times. Practice it alone without all the expansive chords that Brahms gives you. Um, I talked about this uh, on a stream of maybe a month ago, maybe two months ago now. But Brahms is, some people have heard this, Brahms has injured more pianists that I know personally than any other composer. Um, oh, Miguel says, uh, the quote is by Rubinstein. Well, I, I'll give Rubinstein credit for that then. <laughs> um, so, uh, Miguel, yeah, uh, make sure we know where the melody goes. Make sure we can play the most beautiful phrase one note at a time. That's not practicing the technique for it, but it's really training our ear to understand wh where exactly we want to take our phrase. If it's possible to play that with the correct finger on that melody pitch, do that too. Um, now, when we add back in all of the stretches that Brahms writes for us, um, even if you have an easy octave, even if it, that is just a piece of cake for you to play, it still can be very easy if we're practicing for hours. It can be very easy to let that stretch actually cause tendonitis and other problems. And that has what's happened to other pianists I know that play a lot of Brahms, or if they spend four hours a day practicing Brahms, and they're always stretched, and they don't give the hand time to relax. So make sure as you're going through things, keep that in mind. As we stretch to play those melody notes, as we lean, I don't know, um, 118 off the top of my head. But as we lean into, I know it's an A flat, or the, the, yeah, the one I'm thinking. So as we lean into those melody notes, and we need to make sure five is nice and strong and it's got that great support behind it, the rest of the hand has a chance to relax. So I can stand on fifth finger anytime I need to, which is all the time in Brahms, and I can move the rest of the hand very freely around. So, even if it's a very more stretched voicing like that, this is still very loose. That's the biggest thing I would recommend with Brahms, technique-wise. Uh, in the intermezzi, there isn't a lot of... Mm, they're not super difficult to navigate compared to some other rep. Um, but the thing that does get people are the stretches. So, yeah, be mindful of those. And Miguel, you also asked... Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. How do you know if you're prepared to learn a piano concerto? I have two comments on that. Um, Miguel, are you, are you studying, and for everybody, are you studying to be a performer? Are you playing for fun? Um, why, what is the reason that you're, you're studying piano and that you want to play? Um, and I ask because people that tune in here, where there are a variety, they come from a variety of, let's say, music backgrounds. Some people are adult beginners and they just want to have fun. And other people, so Miguel, you just said, other people like what you just said, um, want to be performers. So that's really important. Okay. Miguel, if you're playing Brahms 118, there's no reason why you couldn't pick up uh, and start to learn um, Mozart concerti, something like that, um, or or maybe maybe even Beethoven one, two. Um, not too late. Um, I'd stay away from the romantic stuff and the neo-romantic and Russian rep for now. Um, depending on what else you've performed as well, but um, stick with yeah some of the shorter Mozart concerti. That would be a great place to start. And it'll get you used to kind of the concerto form. And um, I think those would be great for you. And if you're playing Brahms, there's probably no, no reason why uh, we couldn't pick up a Mozart like that. Uh, Rajat said Kabalovsky or Grieg. Um, those are good to start with. Yeah, I'd second, especially the Grieg. Um, yeah, that would be good. I would want to pick something that isn't so long. So something that's shorter, if it can be around, you know, 20 minutes for the whole concerto, that would be something that I'd be looking for. Um, we don't want something that's 30 minutes, uh, you know, or longer. 
<laughs> it'll be it might be very difficult to get through depending on how much you know sonata work you've done and things like that um, if you haven't played any massive sonatas that are 25 30 40 minutes long we don't want to jump into a concerti that's like that either so that might that's another good test you know if you've played some of the really big long beethoven sonatas um that can be uh, a great indicator that you might be ready for something else if you've played Mm, Chopin's second or third sonata, you're definitely ready for romantic concerti. Um, yeah. Miguel, uh, Miguel asks, is Beethoven one of the easiest? All of Beethoven's concerti are going to be hard. <laughs> but in general, earlier Beethoven is easier than later Beethoven. Earlier Beethoven is, is a little bit more, more Mozartian in style and in the way the hand works. And as you go later and later and later in his life and in his repertoire, his vocabulary, the technical vocabulary expands much, much more. Um, so in general, if we haven't played Beethoven concerti before or even Beethoven sonatas, full sonatas, I usually stick to some of the earlier ones because they tend to be um, not quite as difficult in many ways. Length, technique required. And they also feel a little bit more similar to um, to Mozart than his later work. Mm. Kenny chimes in. Beethoven two and two is written first. Thanks for that, Kenny. I did not know that. So thank you for chiming in. And Kenny, it's good to see you. <laughs> awesome. All right. Let's see. I'm just going to scroll back through, make sure I didn't miss any questions. I see Bunny Hollow is here, so welcome, Bunny. Tiago had a question. So, Tiago, this is a while ago, so I'm sorry, I'm just getting to it now. But Tiago asked, he said, I've added cadences to the end of my scale practices. Why are there preset cadences? Uh, why are they different to any other chord progressions? And you do one, four, five, one. The typical cadences that we learn are always one, four. I would go back through one. So let's not do C major. Um, B. So um, we always want to, I would always go through one for your voicing. Uh, and ending scales with that is a great idea, right? Um, this is something I actually just talked with one of my private students about. Great to not just practice root position, but play the all the cadences in their their inversions as well. Right? So first inversion and second inversion. Um, there's seven. So we feel all of those different shapes and get those really nicely in your fingers. Why do we pick those chords in particular? Because in classical music, they, those are the foundational chords. One, they get us through every chord type, every harmonic function. One is tonic, four is predominant, five is dominant. So we get one of each type of chord in a very condensed package. You can create your own cadences. That's absolutely fine. And some of the syllabi actually require, as you study more and more, that um, you create cadence patterns of your own, and you can write them down on a written portion and then also play them uh, for a jury. So that would be also something to think about. You can come up with anything of, on your own. It could be any, any pattern. But we usually want to start with a tonic function, and then we want to have dominant lead us back around to tonic for it to be a classical-sounding uh, cadence progression. Uh, so you could throw six in there, you could throw two in there, you can throw three, the three chord, all of those things. Um, but we'll probably want to start on one. Um, Tiago, if you know um, something else you might want to check out. Cadence is, the term is used for a couple different, that uh, has a couple different meanings. When we talk about playing a cadence at the piano, in a, a cadence pattern, we're talking about going through these chord progressions. But cadence in harmonic analysis means something else. It means how we end a phrase. And there are lots of different types of cadences. That can also inform. If you know, so go and look up different cadence types 
authentic cadences, perfect and imperfect authentic cadences, um, half cadences, deceptive, plagal. Those are our main ones. Um, look up what those are, what differentiates them. You can add those into your practice. Say, I want to create a cadence pattern that is a half cadence. Half cadence ends on five. So no, that changes our chord progression and it changes where we end, right? It doesn't sound like coming back home. Um, it sounds like we're stuck on dominant. <laughs> but the point of that, half cadences are supposed to sound like questions. They're supposed to leave a phrase unanswered. So, yeah, those are some things I would add to your practice, Tiago, and that's why those chords are typically used, one, four, and five. All right. I'm going to jump back. Dith had a kind of a follow-up. Um, Dith said, uh, we were talking about getting frustrated in practice, and Dith said, I'd settle for something like a mix between just for fun and performing. Uh, ideally, it would be nice to be able to play easy and intermediate songs without having to practice for a month. I think that's a great goal, Dith. Uh, <laughs> something about practicing Jingle Bells in November doesn't feel right. I hear you. <laughs> Especially... Um, I regularly perform Christmas concerts, and I write a ton of Christmas arrangements. It's the, the biggest part of my catalog, um, because I do a massive amount of arranging and composition. My, maybe half or more of my entire catalog of work is Christmas, and so I'm working on it all year. I've been working on Christmas already this year, <laughs> because I have projects for different clients that are coming out that need to be ready, that need to get ready for distribution and then come out later. So I absolutely know it's not always the most fun to work on Christmas in June or July, or in my case, I started in April. Um, <laughs> but I totally hear you. Um, it would be nice to be able to play some of that stuff in a couple of weeks. Uh, so absolutely keep going, keep pushing yourself and keep pushing into harder and harder rep diff because the harder rep we accomplish, the more technique we build, the easier all of that intermediate rep is going to become and any other arrangements or pieces that you want to play. Um, so in general, we can think about this kind of like sight reading practice. The level that we need to spend the most time studying, the level of piece, that's our maybe our upper limit, right? Something that is takes months to months or longer to learn. As we drop the level down, we're going to find if we drop significantly down, let's say, I'm thinking about the RCM levels because I'm most familiar with those. If we're playing, if we're able to practice for a few months and perform eventually music that's level eight, nine, close to the top of the RCM trajectory. If we drop back down to level two or so, I would say we should be able to pretty much sight read that stuff. Split the difference, and we're at about level four or five, that's going to be music that we should be able to play with relatively little practice. So Dith said, um, your teacher puts you on RCM4. Clementi in RCM4 is, um, that's, um, that's good. That's great. Um, that's kind of the beginning, I think, of, of where I would give Clementi to a student. But it's great. It's, it would be a, it'll be a nice push for you. So I would say, Dith, if you look at repertoire that's up, in level one or so, we should be close to being able to sight read that. And level two or so are going to be things that you will be able to close to sight read or, or uh, be able to play with just a week or two of practice, play well with just a week or two of practice. Um, the, the further we can continue to push that level up, of course, the more access to other repertoire we have. So we want to continue raising that level right? And always have a piece, I think, always have a piece that's pushing us to a new level, that's, that's challenging us to think, that's challenging the fingers to do what they need to do at the keyboard. Uh, and as we continue to create, uh, give ourselves more and more and more of those challenges, especially if we branch out and do many different composers, our hands are going to be given tools, the tools they need to play other repertoire much more readily. Um, so, yeah, that's that's a that's a great comment, and I totally understand where you're coming from. That it's nice to not have everything you play take.
I see we just asked, what do you think about when you're sight reading at the level you're at right now? Or is that to me or is that to Dith, Rajat? <laughs> I think it was probably to Dith. So Dith, what are you sight reading? That would be a good question. And if you're not, start doing some. <laughs> um, just ask your teacher for, um, gosh, anything. Do some sight reading in your lesson time. Um, because then you actually, you get that little bit of added pressure. Uh, oh, I'm sorry that the sound is coming in and out. I don't know if there's anything I can do about that. It might be an internet thing. Um, all right. So, Dith, if you're, I would add some sight reading to your lesson time with your teacher. Just ask for it. And also add some um, sight reading to, on, in your own time. An easy thing to do would be to just get the RCM levels or whatever you're working on and go back three or four levels at least and try to sight read some stuff in that book um, or find some pieces that are a few levels below. This says you try to play songs out of a hymnal. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Let's see. Aram had a question. Uh, so let me jump over to that. Aram said, you've started about a year ago with a piano teacher. Do you think it's better to get a lot out of pieces, uh, get a lot of pieces to be an acceptable level, or would you recommend really trying to polish pieces? I always recommend polishing. Well, I, I do this with all of my in-person students. Um, we're not, the, 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 the level that I ask for or that I demand from a student Demand is a harsh word, but I think you know what I mean. <laughs> the level that I'll accept as this is good enough for where we are right now, that is very dependent on, on how long you've been studying and what you're trying to do with music. But if you've been a year into lessons, I would absolutely say yes. There should be a level of polish. There should be a level of musicality. Um, one year in, there are people can be in many, many different places one year in. Some people might be in beginner in beginner method books. Other people I've known after one year that are playing Bach preludes and fugues and bigger rep. It really so that really depends. The further down, the further we go into repertoire, the higher the standard gets, and that's uh, at least for me in in my teaching. Um, but that said, I'm always at, I'm I'm never okay with hearing anything at any level. Even if we're talking about a complete beginner, never touched the piano before, I'm never okay with it being chunky and clunky and unmusical. <laughs> so there is always a tension given, even from the even when we have one note at a time, there's always a tension being given to how do we make a nice phrase? As much as what the hand needs to do and what our ear needs to pay attention to. There are I know so many people that are so highly trained pianists. They, they have built great techniques and they still don't know how to listen to themselves play. It's not an easy thing to accomplish. But I'm going to go there. So I know people that have worked on, in, in the middle of a doctorate in music or beyond, that still cannot make musical decisions on their own without a coach or a teacher. To me, that's a failure, not of the student, but a failure of how we've taught people. Um, from the very beginning, because we should have an, at least some idea. We should have a, some idea of how we want phrases to go, and we should be constantly educating that idea ourselves about what makes a good musical phrase and what doesn't. Um, and why we make the choices in interpretation that we make. Now, granted, there is definitely a time and a place for teachers because there is a big divide between making up our mind about something and understanding what makes a great musical choice a great choice. Of course, we need to learn those things. But 
the whole time, we should be using our ears and should be listening and should be reacting to the sound that's coming out of our instrument. And this it might be something that I think pianists struggle with more than all other instrumentalists because all other instrumentalists have to be in control of their intonation, and we don't. Rarely is a pianist a piano tuner, and never can we change the tuning of the instrument while we're playing it. But think about it. All other instrumentalists and vocalists, they are constantly listening because they have to listen for intonation, among other things. Um, so, and Kenny, yeah, I just saw Kenny's comment. Listening is something that should be taught early on and unfortunately isn't. And I 100%, 100% agree with that. Um, oh, I can't remember. Um, let me see here. Newhouse. Um, if you've ever read any, uh, any of Newhouse's thoughts on teaching and piano pedagogy and, and especially his book, The Art of Piano Playing, he is absolutely a fan of that and so am I. <laughs> um, that from lesson one, we're learning how to listen. And um, there, there was kind of a new fad going on I'm going to call it a fad. It's not exactly. It's very, very scientific, but it's becoming more and more popular with teachers, and that's what I mean by fad, but of uh, something called music learning theory, uh, and it incorporates a ton of audiation early, early on, to the point where even sometimes um, lessons are completely about hearing music, interpreting rhythm with the body, and feeling it before we touch the piano at all. And sometimes that can go on for years. Um, that part I'm not sold on. <laughs> um, I'm not sold on keeping them isolated for that long. Maybe for very young children, yes. But um, if we're talking about adults, I don't think so. I think they can be incorporated very quickly. But the most important thing is that it does get incorporated because, uh, yeah, there are so many so many pianists I know that um, if they're not told to play forte, they don't. If it's not in the score, there isn't, uh, a, an, there isn't a side of them that says this doesn't sound right. Um, and if the teacher doesn't say something, there's not a side of them that says this doesn't sound right. Um, and especially for those of you, there are a number of you here today that are performers or are studying to be performers. That is absolutely part of our job, <laughs> is reacting to, one, having a great plan, a musical plan that can change, but having a plan and knowing where we're going to start and the journey we take people on. And secondly, if something happens in performance, we need to be able to take what happened that we didn't plan on and have attuned enough ears and know how our ears and our hands communicate that we can make adjustments on the fly uh, and say, you know, if we ended a phrase, one phrase, if we ended it in a slightly different way than we're used to or than we, when we wanted to, maybe we could call that a mistake. We didn't play any wrong notes, but we didn't quite round the phrase off the way we wanted to. That should probably impact the way we begin the next phrase if it's going to be a successful, the most successful performance. And so the lesson behind all of that is that the ears are always tuned in. They're never tuned out. They're never not aware of what's going on. And I'm ranting about this just because I've seen so many pianists at play, that play at very high levels that simply aren't aware of what they're playing, really. <laughs> um, so Kenny just said, um, even when you're practicing studies like Cherney, you should be listening to what you're doing. Um, and Cherney exercises can be a great place to start training yourself to listen. Cherney is, yeah. Um, you know, if you can make Cherny musical, at least it's not Hannon. <laughs> um, so at least you've got some places to go, even though a lot of times it's usually one, four, five, one, or one, 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 five, one. Um, but there's still a phrase. Cherny at least built phrases in for us. And so there is something to do and there's something to listen to. Um. <laughs> Yeah, 
Great. Let's see, Aram says, um, just to follow up on this, you recently started focusing on musicality of pieces and watched, oh, thanks for watching the Chopin Masterclass. Thanks, Aram. Yeah, uh, you know, it's incredible. Um, and I'm doing more and more of masterclasses and there'll be many more, but even when they're two hours long, there's so much that I cannot say. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, think about if you were to take lessons on a, on a piece of music and ha how many hours you've ha you would have in-person lessons on that. Talking about the finest details. Yeah, there's always an incredible amount. Some of you, if you're on my email list, you'll, you'll know this, but I'll bring it up because I think many of you aren't. Um, there was one of the um, one of my lessons that was in my undergrad that stands out the most was I was working on um, Mozart sonata. Right. And we spent my teacher and I spent the entire hour talking about that what I just played and experimenting with these are just octaves. We might think, but what if you voice the bottom note up? It changes. What if you voice the top note up? What if they're all even? <laughs> How long is the, the release of each of these? I can't remember offhand if they're staccato or just detached, but if is, it, is it really short or is it longer? Right? And that's all of those questions are all about deciding musically and using your ear to tell us which one do we like and why and how is it going to impact the entire rest of our interpretation of this piece or this movement. And of course, what tempo do we take? There's so much. <laughs> and that force, just as in this example, the force with which we play the opening bar changes how we play bar two. Right? And if we don't play it with that much force, even though it's forte, well, we now have a different option. Maybe arguably we can have different options, of course, both, both directions. But if the forte is less, the second phrase, well, there are other things that are going to work well in the second phrase. And all of that is impacted simply by listening. So. <laughs> and Jess just said, I don't understand how you can get to a doctor level without an understanding of something so fundamental. Yeah. It's because there are, we live, I think, we live in an era of great technicians at the piano. There are people that, <laughs> that can do things with the body at this instrument that are astounding. And there are more of them, I think, than ever before in history. So you can go to a concert and be wowed. And... Um, and I think there's also a, um, a bit of an, um, a cultural um, issue with classical music performance. Um, because in an era of, of having recorded music, perfect recorded music at our disposal, at our fingertips 24 seven, um, people have come to demand note perfect performances live. That's great to strive for, but not at the expense of moving, mu music that moves us. Uh, and I think that has also, it's not just on the concert stage and at the premier levels of classical music, but it's also, it's pervading music academia as well, where there are a lot of people that care so much about playing the right notes that um, they don't spend enough time thinking about why, why they're playing the notes to begin with.
Rajat says a, a documentary called The Art of Piano on YouTube. I have not seen that one. That is interesting. I'll have to look that up. Oh, great, great conversation. I love this. <laughs> And Kenny said um, there's a real connection between the C minor fantasy, which is the same, uh, it's part of the same grouping of, wor of, of Mozart and Bach's musical offering. I will have to look that up as well, Kenny. <laughs> uh, I've not played the fantasy, um, only the sonata. Uh, see, Rajat was saying about the documentary, you get a window into the approach toward music making during the early 20th century. I love that era of piano performance. Um, yes, and how harmonic sensitivity, uh, improvisatory sensitil sensitil sensit sensibilities <laughs> were so crucial. Yes. And that's another thing that is very lost in a lot of classical players today is the ability to improvise. I'm not great at it myself, but um, I can make my way around the keyboard with a lot of different chord progressions in styles that that's aren't classical. <laughs> so I know harmony at least well enough to do that, but I can, I mean, I cannot improvise like Chopin, not, not if my life depended on it. <laughs> um, but that's a really, really crucial thing. And there's another, I know I have a subscriber here. Um, he's not in the stream today, but... Um, he and I have had talks about the Chopin competition and how there should be a, an improvisatory segment or round in the Chopin competition because it was such a massive part of his music making. And all of that is gone from, from piano competitions. I mean, it's, it is not a part of any piano competitions. Those of you, um, here's a good question for all of you. What do you think of piano competitions? Should they be around? Do they really produce or are first prize winners really the best pianists? And what do you think of people that have never competed but perform a lot, like Yuja? That's uh, very famous that she, was never, she never entered in any competitions. Yet, she is one of the premier stars in classical music. Um, so while you're, while you're thinking about that, Lewis says, who are your favorite pianists? And I think everybody can answer this too. Um, I usually lean toward kind of the, what I would call the golden era. Rubinstein, Horowitz, um, sometimes Pellini. Um, in more modern, mo more modern pianists, usually Arkerich, as long as she doesn't take things too fast. <laughs> um, Axe and Bronfman. Um, gosh, there is, um, there's a, an album of Yo-Yo Ma and Emmanuel Axe playing Rachmaninoff's cello sonata that is just to die for, and it's from the 90s, and I... Once I heard that recording, I, I won't listen to any other recording of the, the cello sonata again. <laughs> it's, nobody, just, nobody comes close. <laughs> and Kenny says, Gabriela Montero. I'll look her up, Kenny. And there are a couple people I've seen on YouTube that are just, um, they are very talented improvisers. Uh, and it's a lot of fun to watch. But... They are so few and far between. And even in daily life, go to, go to a conservatory and go walk down you know, the practice hallway and ask. You'll have 20 pianists there. Ask any of them to improvise. And the chances that any can are they're around 0%. <laughs> Once in a while, you get someone that's double majoring in jazz and they can do it. <laughs> Um, 
let's see, Rajat says, piano competitions are a good way to methodically get exposure and to put yourself out there. And I don't think first place winners are always the best, but they're often the most sound with fundamentals. Yeah. I'd agree with that. Um, Kenny, no, I was talking about Bronf, um, uh, Bronfman, Bronfman Axe recording of um, Rachmaninoff two piano works. So the, the symphonic dances and the suites, um, that is fantastic. I don't know the Brahms Sonata for two pianos that they recorded. I've not heard that one. But I was talking about Yo-Yo Ma and Emmanuel Axe playing the Rachmaninoff cello sonata. Um, Antonio said, uh, you, uh, you remember me saying that I changed my mind about Polini. <laughs> I guess um, I'm hearing more and more that I like out of Polini's interpretations, the older I get. <laughs> I used to feel, I think, that um, in general, things were a bit um, bland and rushed. Uh, but now I'm hearing other details that I tune in on. Uh, and gosh, I think we all have favorite pianists that we tend to listen to, and we find our favorite piece, you know, recordings of specific pieces by those people. And, um, those greatly influence how we um, think about or hear interpretations of others. So, yeah, I'm like well, what I just said. I always, every new recording of the Rachmaninoff cello sonata, I'm always comparing to Yo-Yo Ma and Emmanuel Axe. So far, none of them, including Yuja, and I think it was Capuçon, I think it was the two of them playing together, they recorded rock cello sonata. I just didn't like it as much. They're fantastic players. It just didn't have the same magic for me. So Kenny says, the Brahms Sonata on YouTube. Okay, I'll check that out, Kenny. Bachwitz fellow was replying to Kyle. Did I miss what Kyle had to say? I think I did. I think I saw it and we got caught up in another conversation. Thanks, Bachwitz fellow, for, for um, bringing that back up. Now I have to find Kyle's comment. <laughs> Oh, okay, Kyle said, Recent, you recently tried voicing your own piano with a safety pin, and it kind of worked. How ill-advised is DIY piano tech? And let's see, Bachwards Fellow says, the issues for DIY piano tech are knowing what results you're wanting to achieve, how to achieve them, and how to fix it if you mess up, yes. Okay, Kyle, there, you can find some information online about this, but in general, if you're trying to work on voicing, never, ever, ever, <clears throat> stick anything longer than uh, like uh, a millimeter, maybe not even that long, to the strike on the strike point. Don't ever do that on your hammers. It's extremely easy to kill the hammers if you if you needle the very top of them where they where they strike the strings. Um, <clears throat> how you s use needles or safety pins in your case to work the felt around the hammer is is all different. I'm not an expert at that, but I can tell you that one, never do the strike point unless you have a sugar coater or that tool that is, has tiny, tiny, tiny pins on it. It's the only thing that's safe. And secondly, most needling happens on the shoulders of the hammer. And needling is all about loosening the felt on the hammer, right? So how we loosen it impacts <laughs> how, this, how the hammer hits the string and the, the uh, byproduct, the sound byproduct, right? Um, <clears throat> that's all I'm going to go for. <laughs> One thing that my tech has been working on on this instrument, because I just put new hammers on it, is some of the notes that we're trying to bring up without juicing them. He is needling the underside of the shoulders because if you loosen the felt on the bottom of the hammer, it makes the compression of the top of the hammer uh, easier. So when you apply force to the top of the hammer, you get more compression, which leads to a brighter sound, all without juicing at all. Juicing is putting lacquer on the hammers to harden them. Um, so that's an interesting thing that we're going through uh, with this instrument right now. 
And in some cases, in the treble area, it's worked pretty well. And, and lower down, it just hasn't, hasn't made a big enough difference. So <clears throat> the only thing that I do personally on my piano is fix unisons <laughs> with a tuning hammer. That's the only thing I do. And I've gotten decently good enough that I can keep a unison in tune. I can set the pin well enough that it stays for at least a couple days <laughs> uh, before I've knocked it out again. And it used to be really bad where within about 30 minutes of playing on something, it would be horrible sounding. And so I've gotten better at setting pins, but that's, that's all I do on the inside. And I call my tech out for anything else that I want worked on because I don't trust myself. And it costs a lot of money to fix some things if you do them wrong. <clears throat> Bockwood's fellow asked, did I get that transition in the bass smoothed? No. <laughs> <laughs> we worked on it. It's okay. Actually, the B flat came up some, but A is pretty muted. Uh, we did a bunch more of lacquering down here. And lower in the register, it came up really nicely. But G, A flat, A, those three are still left. And they're not this, they don't have the same overtones. Um, let me just go back to Rajat's two. I have two comments. Your favorite pianists alive, Rajat, are Zimmerman, uh, Song Jin Cho, Yun Chun Lim, Trivenoff, Baba Yan, and your professor, David Fung. Awesome. Um, Baba Yan, I, I was able to attend some Baba Yan master classes years ago. He was great. I heard him play, uh, he was playing. Um, Schubert, Wanderer. That was very interesting, and his master class on that piece was interesting also. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd very much agree with your list, Rajat. Um, I'm trying to think of if there are any others that I would put in there. Trifonov, I, I usually have really very much enjoyed his recordings. I've not gotten to hear him play. He was in Denver, which is very close to me. Um, last year, I think last September, uh, and I have not seen that he's come back here. So, but I would love to go hear him play. Uh, and Rajat says, "What are you composing these days?" So, I, I think I mentioned the commission that I have of the Beatles song that I'm working on, and um, I have just finished on my other channel. <laughs> I put out a lot of arrangements that I write and uh, uh, performances. I do a lot of arranging of pop music and movie music and music theater for solo piano. Uh, and that's um, a massive amount of my own performing has been all of my work for the last, let's say, six years or so. I'll throw in a classical piece here and there, a traditional, you know, from the canon piece of music on those programs. Uh, but for the last six years, the only time I've played a fully traditional classical program as if I'm doing collaborative work. Uh, in which case, there could be all kinds of stuff, you know. Um, but all my solo concertizing these days is all uh, either original music of mine, which are usually amount to some shorter pieces, sometimes contemporary in nature, sometimes class romantic, let's say, Chopin-esque. Um, or, and what usually gets requested, are my arrangements of like popular music theme, uh, uh, movie themes and things like that. So usually if I get called to do a concert, it's come play, you know, selections from your movie album. And, uh, and what I'm doing with those are, they're similar to, I, I would call them similar to like list transcriptions of opera. So very pianistic, challenging, um, and in general, trying to recreate, truly recreate the orchestra on the piano, which uh, the whole reason I even started doing that work is because I was, there was nothing available to sheet music to purchase that sounded anything like orchestrations of that stuff. And um, recently I've branched into doing some solo piano transcriptions of some classical music. Like one that started us off on the stream today was Nessun Dorma. Uh, and a couple months ago, I, I wrote a transcription of that. Um, and then I also wrote a transcription of uh, meditation from Thais. Uh, that is 
not intermediate, no longer intermediate, but an advanced piece of music that more accurately represents what the orchestra plays and what the violinist plays. So, yes, Rajat, that's, that's the kind of stuff that I'm regularly working on. <laughs> um, and because of the commission I've been writing, I haven't, uh, I'm not working on anything else at the moment, just trying to get that wrapped up. Let's see. Bockwards Fellow is working on Schubert's Wanderer. You said you were going to submit a video of that, Bockwards Fellow. I'm, I'm look, still looking forward to hearing from that. <laughs> um, Dith says, <laughs> uh, your, your cousin owns Denver Beer Company. I will we'll check it out. My wife and I are, are beer fans. And uh, yeah. Colorado Springs, where I live, is only about an hour away from Denver, depending on what part of Denver you're going to. So it's all pretty close. Thanks for telling me that, Dith. I'll, I'll check it out. And everybody thought he was crazy, but he's probably enjoying life a whole lot more, right? Oh, <laughs> uh, and Rajat, thanks. Um, I think most of my videos on this channel have a link to my other one. Um, there's, there are some classical performances out there, too. Um, that you can check out. That's actually how I started the channel 10 years ago, was posting classical performances from my degree programs. <laughs> so if you go way, way, way back, you can hear the Mozart Sonata that I just played the opening bar of. You can hear, uh, you can hear a lot of stuff on the channel. But what I'm doing more recently is, and there I've written something like 100 arrangements uh, over the last number of years. So there's a plenty of stuff out there. Um, usually, these streams go about an hour to an hour and a half, depending on questions people have. So I think it's, uh, it's a good time to wrap this one up. Um, but thank you for everybody for tuning in and um, lots of great, great, great questions and lots of great discussion. Um, remember that um, I know Rajat and I talk, we talked about this, but if you have pieces you'd like to submit for a masterclass, videos you'd like to submit, there are directions on how to do that um, below in the description. And um, it's always free absolutely free and I'm I love doing it and I love sharing my thoughts on music with everybody so I would have a blast listening to uh, Rajat if you said I think you said you're playing the rock 2 sonata um I would love to hear if you want to submit just a movement we wouldn't obviously be able to listen to the whole thing on a stream but just a movement or even a selection of a movement would be just fine a and anybody else Bachwards fellow wander <laughs> Um, and anybody else that's open to all, all levels, we've been talking about a little bit more advanced stuff than we usually do on here today, but um, when we kicked off today, we heard Antonio's very, very first piece of music, and I'm always happy to listen to stuff like that as well and give whatever helpful comments I can. So every level is always welcome. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. If you're new to the channel, because I know I've, we have a few people here that I think just found the last video I put out. If you're new to the channel, I do a lot of uh, practice tips and I put out master classes on various specific pieces. And right now they've been um, focused on intermediate level stuff. Uh, intermediate, let's say early intermediate to intermediate level stuff. And, uh, but those are going to continue to be branching out into more and more. Antonio, it was my pleasure. Thanks for sending the video in. Thanks everybody for joining in uh, today. If you haven't already, please give this video a like. It helps out. I know it's always weird to ask. <laughs> but please click that thumbs up button. And um, uh, we do these streams every two weeks, or the second and fourth Wednesday of every month. So you can always feel free to tune back in. They happen regularly. And um, yeah, so if you want to submit a video two weeks from today will be the time that we'll review it. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And um, I hope that you'll check out other stuff around the channel if you haven't already. And I hope that you'll tune back in next time we do one of these live streams. All right. Have a great day. Practice smarter, not harder. Practice if you haven't practiced yet today. <laughs> and I'll see you next time. All right. Take care, everybody.